we will continue our discussion about affine scaling method uh, today i want to minimize c transpose x ax equals to b x is greater than or equal to 0 and the way i want to find out uh, i want to run the iteration xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k x bar k <coughs> minus xk and i need to pick alpha k and i think x bar k was basically argument of C transpose X This is what we had done in the previous class. And we got the solution that x bar k equals to 1 over 2 sk. Okay, so this is what this is where we stopped at the previous class, and there were two things we needed to figure out. One is how do I pick alpha k or how do I pick s k, and then uh, how do I pick h k? Those are the two questions we did not discuss in the previous class. So let's first talk about uh, let's first talk about so we can we can actually uh, if you look at the expression uh, what we have is x bar k minus x k actually contains both alpha k and s k together. So if I pick x bar k minus x k, what I get is minus s k hk inverse c minus a transpose lambda k. So this sk and this alpha k is going to get multiplied together. So all we need to figure out is how do we pick my alpha k in this case. So let's say my uh, sk is equal to 1. So I'm going to pick sk is equal to 1. And all I need to do is pick alpha k. I'm going to pick alpha k in the set alpha greater than 0 such that Okay, and uh, I wanted to remind you also of the way this algorithm is working. 
So this is what my ax equals to b x greater than or equal to 0 set looks like. And I start with some initial point x0. And I just keep moving away from the boundary. I never touch the boundary at all. This is the way to uh, do the iterations under this particular, uh, under this algorithm. OK, so now we have everything we had in the, on the board in the previous class. So, so all of you follow until here. So here everything is clear. After that, I'm going to pick my sk equals to 1. I'm going to pick my alpha k in this particular fashion. So recall that I always want my x to be greater than 0. OK, so inside, x is greater than 0. Along the sides, one of the x i's will become equal to 0. So here, you could have x1 equal to 0. Here, you will have x2 equals to 0. This side will have x3 equals to 0. So I don't want my e, any of the x coordinates to be equal to 0. So I'm always going to pick alpha k in a way that the this is my xk plus 1, potential xk plus 1 as a function of alpha. I want it to be greater than or equal to 0. So that I'm always inside. I'm always inside this particular boundary. So that's the way to pick alpha k. Now the question is, what should the value of hk be? What do you think hk? Come up with some hk, some wild guess. Yeah. Identity matrix. Identity matrix, OK. Let's see what happens in identity matrix. OK. So x bar k, x k minus s k, c minus a transpose lambda k. So I'm picking h k to be identity. And my lambda k is a, a transpose inverse a c. This almost feels like I'm just projecting. XK just seems to be projection of C onto the set AX equals to B. Right, so this term C minus A transpose lambda K is basically identity minus So it looks like this direction is not really changing with xk. Okay, the direction seems to be constant. This direction, x minus x minus xk, x bar k minus xk, seems to be a constant. It's not really changing the direction. So with hk equals to identity, I have a problem. As in, I want to do this. I can't take hk equals to identity because my x bar k minus xk is just a constant vector. It's not really moving in any direction. Any other thoughts? So I want to Be bold, be brave, come up with a new HK. Transport yourself back to 1967, you are faced with this issue. And now you need to figure out what HK you need to pick, which will make sense. A transpose A. A transpose A. Uh, that need not be an invertible matrix. Oh. It will be positive, de uh, semi-definite, but need not be positive definite. So here is the uh, here is the HK that was proposed back in 1967 by Dickin. 
So my xk has positive entries, right? Each of the element of xk is positive. So I can take, create a diagonal matrix and I take the inverse square. And this is known as a fine scaling method. SK equals to one, HK equals to minus two, and alpha K is given here. What that choice of HK is doing, whenever a value of one of the coordinates of X becomes close to this particular line, uh, it tries to move the direction, the descent direction away from this, this line. So whenever you are going to zero, one of the coordinate is going to zero, it is going to move things away from zero and move it inwards. Now of course by a careful choice of SK and alpha K and so on, you can try to get to one of the corners as well, but you will never hit the corner. You will always be close, closer and closer to the corner, but you will never be able to hit it. And that's what this algorithm is trying to do. Okay, so you, uh, so remember what all algorithms we talked about. We talked about conditional gradient method and a gradient projection method, both of which required projecting onto the set. And then we are faced with a bunch of problems where projection is no longer an option because projection is a very expensive operation for those sets. So we needed to come up with methods where I don't need to project or uh, at least the projection has to be somewhat simpler than projecting onto the whole set. So basically sets of this type or AX less than equal to B type. So these sets are difficult to project on uh, so we came up with uh, two algorithms. In one algorithm, we actually don't go inside the set. We always stay on the boundary and we move along the boundary until we are forced to go inside the set. Okay, that's one algorithm. So if you are always on the boundary, very easy to project. Okay. The other algorithm we talked about, that was manifold suboptimization method. The other algorithm, a fine scaling method that we talked about, we never go to the boundary, we are always inside, okay? And the way we are inside is by changing this matrix HK, by picking an appropriate matrix HK, we are ensuring that we will always be inside the set, we will never hit the boundary, as a result of which, uh, we will be able to get arbitrarily close to the optimal solution, but we will never be at the optimal solution. But arbitrarily close to optimal solution is good enough for all practical applications, so it doesn't matter. Any question so far on a fine scaling? Yes? Will it reach the optimal point if the optimal point is inside the set? Uh, so this is for a linear programming problem. For linear programming, one um, theorem, which we haven't covered in the class, but it's true, is that the solution will always be at the boundary. It will never be inside the set. The reason for that is a bit complicated, so that's why I'm not covering it in the class, but that is one of the results for linear programming problems. The solution is always at the boundary, never inside the set. What kind of programming problem does it become if it's inside the set? Like quadratic, any nonlinear you can have inside the set. It's just for linear programming it will be. Not just, well, uh, for any concave function. So linear functions are concave functions, so the solution will be at the boundary. If I pick any other concave function, so let's say I pick minus half x transpose qx plus b transpose x, then also the solution will be at the boundary because it's a concave function. But for convex function, the solution could be inside. <coughs> okay. So 
Which one? This one? Yeah. Yes. You pick alpha in a way so that all the entries of xk plus 1 is actually non-negative. So you actually want it to be strictly positive. So alpha k is in this set. Alpha k is in this set. But alpha k is not. Uh, Which one? This? Yeah. yeah, so you want to pick alpha k in the set. Alpha k is not equal to the point where this is equal to zero. Like one of the entries is equal to zero. You always want to make sure that the entries are positive. I want xk to be positive at all points of time. Okay? So I want my xk plus one to be positive. Each entry of xk plus one, I need it to be positive. So that should be strictly positive then? I mean, technically, yeah, you can pick it to be strictly positive. When I'm using inside the set, all I mean is like just figure out what the set is and then pick something which is inside the set. But yeah. Any other question? So what does what, so what is a recipe that you are uh, so now try to come up with your own recipe? What would you like to do? You are faced with an optimization problem. Uh, you want to find a descent direction, right? You are on a constraint set, you want to find a descent direction. So what's the recipe here to come up with an algorithm for solving an optimization problem? So think about it a bit more generally. So don't think purely about C transpose X. Let's assume that you have F of X here. And we know a lot of things now. We know we can take first order Taylor series approximation. We can take second order Taylor series approximation. We can do projection. Um, Sometimes we pick alpha k in a way that my xk plus 1 is strictly positive. So we have figured out a lot of recipes so far. So what's the general recipe here? How do you generally create an algorithm that hopefully converges to a stationary point, which is a potential optimal solution? Let's try to look at the general recipe here. So a general recipe to come up with uh, algorithms is using what is known as a proximal algorithm. And the idea is as follows. So we define a prox operator. Let me define a prox operator. to define it at xk. So I want to minimize f of x. x is in convex set capital X. So we'll start with a little bit of theory of proximal algorithms, and then we'll get into specific nitty gritties of how algorithms are built. OK, so what's the idea behind proximal algorithm? So I have this function f of x. 
And now here is the difference. This f of x could be non-differentiable. Uh, it could be very complicated. The, so the way you define a proximal operator which depends on these two parameters, the function f and the parameter c which is right here. So this proximal operator as a function of f and c applies on xk, xk appears here. And so typically you want to pick x bar k in this particular fashion and then you pick xk plus 1 equals to xk plus alpha k x bar k minus xk. Okay, so here is my proximal operator. Now you might ask, what the heck am I doing? I have the function here. I want to minimize this thing, but instead I have the same function here and I'm minimizing over the same set and now I'm just adding additional term onto this function f of x. What's the point of doing all this? Yes. So right now, at least the way the proximal operator is defined, we are not really pushing it inside the function. But that is one of the things we will do shortly. Yes. Kind of sort of not differentiable because if f is not differentiable, then the whole thing is not differentiable. Yeah, so you make it strongly convex. So your f originally could be a concave function, convex function. It, it can be any nonlinear function. But now what you're doing is you are changing the contours of f of x around xk, explicitly around xk, in order to make the function strongly convex around xk. As a result of which, you can actually potentially solve this minimization problem very easily because it's a strongly convex function, so any iterations you're going to take will converge to a locally optimal solution. And then you get a unique point x bar k in order to solve the problem. So here is my f of x. This is my x. This is my f of x. And my f of x could look something like this. Okay, and I'm standing here at x k. Maybe I'll write it here. Or I could be here as well. I could be here as well. So I could be any of these points. And the problem is the function is not very well behaved around these points because uh, it's not strongly convex around these points. So you can't really come up with a very good descent direction in order by computing x bar k. So what you do is you add this x minus x k square scaled by one over two c. So you add a function here like this. As a result of which the function you get is as follows. Let me just keep one of the xk here. <clears throat> and so you create this strongly convex bowl and then you try to optimize this proximal, op you are trying to optimize uh, this joint function over the convex set, capital X. Now, of course, generally you won't, you won't do it over the entire set. Sometimes you can do it over the entire set, sometimes you may not. But at least you have convexified the function around xk, and then you can try to come up with some algorithm that can improve 
the computation of x bar k itself. So that's one of the reasons why we use proximal algorithms. Now there are many ways by which you can massage this whole thing. For instance, you can take first, in case this is differentiable, you can take first order Taylor series approximation. And then what you get is a something like gradient projection method. Okay, so a lot of complicated things. You can derive all the algorithms that we have talked about just by appropriately picking the value of, uh, by appropriately picking this proximal operator. So, uh, of course, this whole theory has been around for quite some time, so people have tried out various things. So, let's talk about some of those variations of proximal algorithms. So, this is known as regularization. And the purpose of regularization is to convexify the function locally. So let's talk about different types of regularization. So one is, I'm going to call this uh, function d k of x, x k. It's semicolon. So if you notice, a fine scaling method is of the first type, okay? So in a fine scaling method, this is my f of x, and then this is uh, the second term, the regularization term, and so we are picking that regularization term here. Now the second one is somewhat interesting. So you are on a simplex, so this kind of set is known as a simplex. Uh, Many a times you have simplex optimization because you're trying to optimize the probability distribution over n objects. So that's when simplex optimization comes into picture. And in these cases, 
you use this kind of divergence it is known as entropic regularization Okay, for those of you who might have taken information theory or some course in communication, this kind of sort of looks like an entropy and that's why it's called entropic regularization. Now, if you pick first order, uh, you, you pick, take the first order Taylor approximation of F and you use this entropic regularization, you, you get what is known as a mirror descent algorithm. So mirror descent. Is argmin. Gradient F at XK transpose X minus XK. where this is the D used here. Yes. Uh, there is no, there is no uh, general rule, but here xk is a parameter that enters into the function, but it's this thing is actually a function of x, and xk is just a variable that keeps changing from one iteration to another. So that's primarily the reason why the author is using semicolon here. If we have like comma, like f of x comma y, then it indicates that y is also a variable and x is also a variable and both of them can change. So that's where there is a slight difference here. It's appearing more as a parameter than a variable. Okay. Uh, sometimes you have problems of this type. Uh, so this is another benefit of having proximal algorithms. So it's just a generic, uh, so one thing you should note is proximal algorithm is not a single algorithm. It's just a framework and you start thinking along that framework and you start coming up with new algorithms, uh, just using the framework. There's a very nice book about proximal algorithms that is available to download. Uh, just search for proximal algorithms, you will find it. Uh, so you will find a lot of different examples of proximal algorithms in that book. So we are only covering a bunch of, a few examples here. Um, just for fun, uh, this is not something that we generally teach in this class, but because many of you are interested in machine learning and are potentially already taking machine learning concurrently with this class, I think that just knowledge of proximal algorithms would be really useful, uh, depending on whether you see it in that class or not. So third type of problem is I want to minimize f of x plus h of x, x is in capital X. So I, I'll give you an example. Capital X could be Rn and h of x could be one norm of x. So you can of course, uh, do the minimization of f of x 
plus h of x plus dk x x k and this is minimization over the entire x in capital X. So you can do this, that is the exact proximal algorithm with a different regularization term. But actually what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the first order, uh, first order uh, uh, approximation of this. So I'm going to replace this by I'm going to replace it with first order Taylor series. Keep h of x as it is and use the, the usual regularization, the quadratic regularization. That would give me, okay, so that's, that's one. And then dk, one over <coughs> ck square. So then I get the following algorithm. Oh, uh, one over two C K. and xk plus one. Okay, now here if x is in Rn and h of x is one norm of x, then xk plus one is given by an expression xk plus one comma i is sine of x k i Okay, so now uh, going back to the original problem, I want to minimize the function f of x plus some L1 norm over the entire Rn, a topic, a problem that appears a lot in compressed sensing literature. Uh, it also appears in uh, stochastic control and a few other areas as well. So L1, L1 regularization with a function appears in a lot of different areas. We also talked about a specific example a few days back. So we have this problem. So how do I solve this problem? Well, one way to solve it is by picking that proximal algorithm approach and then define ZK 
to be an intermediate step where I'm taking the steepest descent with respect to the function f. And then I'm going to do some sort of, I don't want to say projection. We're not really doing projection, but this operation is separate from this operation. Oh, I should have a zk here, not xk. zk. So I use that zk right here and do something that kind of looks like projection, but it's not exactly projection. It's just solving a minimization problem. It's a proximal operator. This, this thing is actually prox of h comma ck of xk, uh, of zk. So I, did, I, 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 get, I get xk plus 1 by just taking the proximal operator over zk. Okay, and now look at the, look at the expression for this. Uh, I have to change this to z here, and I have to change this to z here. Now look at the expression here, xk plus 1 is sine of zki, so ith component of xk plus 1 is sine of zki max of zki minus alpha k comma 0. Is this an easy step to do? Is this an easy to compute expression? Very easy to compute expression. And you can also parallelize it, so if your x is very high dimensional, let's say a billion dimensional, you can also parallelize it, so you can run this particular operation in every, for every million dimensional over 100 servers, you can do the parallelization for this particular step. And then this step, you still have to run it on some other server, because that's an entire gradient descent algorithm. So all in all, depending on the problem statement at hand, sometimes proximal algorithms will make your life much easier by picking an appropriate regularization term right here, okay? The quadratic one is used very often uh, in the case of regular optimization, and then this uh, Bregman divergence, this is Bregman divergence that is used a lot in the case of optimization over a simplex, okay? One of the assignment problems in the current assignment is also optimization over a simplex, so you will get to solve a problem of this type, but without using all this Bregman divergence stuff. It's a bit complicated. Well, it's not complicated, so let's talk a little bit about mirror descent. Any questions on this before I move on to mirror descent? No? Okay. So going back to mirror descent. So I'm looking at this particular problem. So x bar k equals to argument of this function. X is in, of course, capital X. So by picking the entropic regularization, you can actually solve this problem again by hand. So I have x bar k plus 1 i. gradient i
Okay, so what are we doing here? So if you have a problem, I want to minimize a function over this, uh, this simplex. So I instead formulate it as an proximal, uh, uh, as a proximal algorithm, but I really want to pick the gradient of f here, and I want to pick the entropic regularization here. And I'm minimizing over this set, over the simplex. Now it turns out that if you solve this particular problem, uh, you will have, you, you start with x0, which is strictly positive. So all elements of x0 is strictly positive. What you will find is that your x bar k will also be strictly positive. So this term is strictly positive. So why is this term strictly positive? If you look at this expression, this is positive because you picked the positive term in the very beginning. This term is positive because it's an exponential of some number, some real number, so therefore it must be positive. And then the denominator is sum of positive numbers. So all of this is positive, so therefore this part is positive. So once again, you're going inside the set, you're trying to optimize from within the set. You're not going at the boundary at all in this particular algorithm, in the mirror descent algorithm. The other benefit of mirror descent is you can do this computation separately, right? So you want to take the gradient with respect to xi, you can distribute the gradient computation part to multiple servers and then you can compute the numerator and then just add up all the terms in the numerator you get the denominator okay so denominator is just sum of all the numerators for each of the i's right so i'm picking j going from 1 to n of the same thing that i have in the numerator so very good for parallelization this is very easy to parallelize and then x bar k plus 1 is very easy to compute as well Okay, so easy to compute, easy to parallelize. Instead, if you wanted to use manifold suboptimization method or a fine scaling method, it'll take a lot more effort to try and find what x bar k plus one is going to look like. Oh, did I use x bar k plus one? No, this should be x bar k because this is what I'm trying to solve here. Okay, so roughly that's what the idea of proximal algorithm is. You start with the original proximal operator, then you try to massage the whole problem statement and pick an appropriate regularizer. Once you have massaged the problem appropriately, like for, for instance, taking the first order Taylor series, or in this case, splitting the optimization into a gradient descent step and then finding out the proximal of h and ck. So depending on the problem statement, depending on the situation, you will do different kinds of decomposition. And then by picking an appropriate regularization term, you can simplify the computation of the descent direction. As you can see here, okay, very easy to compute these uh, descent direction or the next iterate and then you can continue to iterate. So one thing, uh, again, this kind of gives you an idea that it's not important in optimization to have the fewest number of iterations. What is important is that the time to compute each iteration has to be low, so, and the number of iterations has to be appropriately smaller. So if you can, if you can so imagine if you have to do Newton's step and projection onto this particular set, even though the Newton, so Newton step is going to take a lot of effort and then projection is going to take a lot of effort even if you converge in maybe five or 10 steps, okay? Uh, but if each of them, if, the, if one iteration is going to take 100 seconds and you only take 10 steps to converge to the optimal solution, you are taking a thousand second, thousand sec it takes thousand seconds to solve the problem. But instead if you come up with something like this and it takes I don't know, 100 milliseconds to compute one iteration and you're taking a thousand iteration, you're still much better off than using something like this. Okay, so even though the number of iterations is very high. So don't judge an optimization algorithm by how many iterations it takes to solve the problem, but judge by how much time it takes to solve the problem and how much computational 
complexity it requires to solve the problem. Can you parallelize it or not parallelize it? Do you have uh, opportunities to parallelize the computation or not? So all of those things goes into the consideration when you are designing an algorithm. And so proximal methods is one of the ways to come up with newer types of algorithms that could potentially work for the specific problem statement that you have with the hardware that you have and with the computational constraints that you have. Okay, so that's all I wanted to leave you with today. Uh, in the next class, I'm gonna talk about Lagrange multiplier theory. We are going to solve constraint optimization problem of different types. So here the constraints were such that you had a convex set. Now we'll talk about situations where the constraint set need not be a convex set. I mean, the constraints are such that need not be convex, and then how do you solve problems of that type? So that's what we'll be talking about in the next class. Thank you.